In this video, we are gonna make a major change to our computer. We are going to upgrade our CPU. No, I'm not gonna put an Intel Core i9 on a breadboard. It's impossible for many reasons. It's not even going to be a good old Pentium. But before I go into details, let me tell you a few words about people who helped me a lot in making this video. PCBWay is a PCB prototyping manufacturer. Multiple PCBs are their star products, ranging from standard PCB, flex PCB, advanced PCB, PCB assembly service and others. They also offer one-stop solution service, apart from the inner PCBs, the outer enclosure could be finished as well, such as 3D printing, CNC machining, injection molding and others, covering different kinds of materials. With PCB Way, makers can realize their ideas into real projects. Apart from that, their open source community is pretty popular among the creators, especially the shared projects section. Many PCB wayers have shared interesting electronic projects there. If you're interested in any of them, you can get the boards there directly. Check them out at pcbway.com. My plan for the next video is to show you in practice how helpful this cooperation with PCB Way is for the series. Now, let's get back to our CPU upgrade. You might think that I would use AT286, as this processor was used after the AT88 in the newer IBM AT computer in 1987. No, I won't get that far today. I'm going to use the AT188. When I tell you that this version contains almost the same CPU core as the AT88, with a couple of new instructions and some of the existing ones executed only slightly faster, you may not be that impressed. But when I tell you that the package contains much more than just a CPU, kind of like modern microcontrollers, I hope I will get you more interested. Additionally, it appears much more easily available to buy on popular websites than the AT88 is these days. In fact, that was the reason why I've made this video now. Originally, I planned it slightly later, but you've asked me multiple times about where you could purchase the AT88. Ok, so what do we have inside this AT188? I compared it to a microcontroller, but it would be an overstatement. It doesn't contain any RAM or flash memory like today's microcontrollers do, because at the time static RAM was very expensive and flash memory wasn't yet a thing at all, but it does contain several peripherals. But before we talk about the peripherals, let me tell you about different versions of this processor. First of all, we have the AT188 and AT186, and the difference between them is exactly the same as between the AT88 and AT86, which is the size of the data bus. Then again, similarly, we have the AT188 without any letters in between and the ATC188. The former one is the old original NMOS series and the latter is the newer CMOS fully static series of the chips. Then we have five different CMOS versions, the one without any letters after the part number, three versions with two letters following the part number when the first one is E, which are EA, EB and EC, and finally the XL version of the chip. The one without any letters is simply a fully compatible version with the original NMOS chip. The E versions are even more complex chips working in the so-called enhanced mode, which is not back compatible, allowing for power save mode, the DRAM memory refresh unit and direct interfacing with the MATHS coprocessor, the ATC187. On top of that, the EB and EC versions contain even GPIO pins and the UARTs or their serial ports. Finally, the Excel version is the best of both worlds. By default, it starts in the compatible mode, but a special reset sequence may turn on the enhanced mode if required. From now on, we will focus on the original ATC188 and the XL version working in compatible mode, which are pin for pin replaceable and seem to be currently the most easily available to purchase. Ok, I mentioned peripherals, but exactly what peripherals does this little chip have? Clock generator and the ready logic from the AT284? It's there. Interrupt controller? Check. Timers? Yep, included. Remember these NAND gates generating chip select for both the RAM and the flash memory? Provided. The I.O. address decoder for our peripherals? We don't need it anymore. It is inside this humble package as well. 
We already could replace most of the chips on our breadboards with this one I see here, but it doesn't even stop there. This package also contains the DMA or Direct Memory Access Controller, which we haven't even mentioned yet in this series. Ok, after this initial excitement, now let me mention a few drawbacks. As you can see, it is not a simple in-place replacement for the AT88. Not only is the package physically different, but also the peripherals inside it are not fully compatible with the chips we already have on our breadboards and therefore need to be programmed separately. So for example, the interrupt controller has different registers than the AT259 and requires different treatment in software. You may also be wondering how am I gonna put the square package onto the breadboard? Obviously, I can't do it directly, but I can use this temporary adapter. It doesn't simply reorganize all 68 pins into a one line. The breadboard itself has only 60 or so rows and wouldn't fit them all, so I've made some simplifications. First of all, multiple power supply pins are joined together on this adapter. Also, I omitted a few pins we aren't going to use, soldered all unused inputs directly to either ground or VCC, and finally, I put the crystal for the clock generator and the reset button straight onto the adapter instead of pulling the relevant pins out of the breadboard. Before we build a new computer using this ATC188 chip, let's go through all of its pins, focusing on the new pins compared to the AT88. The 20 pins of the address and data bus are exactly the same as in the AT88. Interesting fact you may notice here is that ATC188 doesn't have two separate bus modes anymore, the minimum and the maximum, like the AT88 had, but most of the bus control signals from both modes are available in ATC188. Most notably, there is no IOM pin in the latter anymore. It can be decoded using the bus cycle status pins S0, S1 and S2, but in most cases you would never need this signal in the first place. Why? I'll explain it in a minute. Apart from that, instead of the ready signal in the AT88, we now have SRDY and ARDY, which are synchronous and asynchronous ready signals instead. That's the part of the circuitry of the AT284 chip here embedded in the ATC188. The other part of the AT284, which was the clock generator, is now built in as well. So now, instead of a single clock input, we have two pins which you connect a crystal to and the clock output which can be used in other peripherals. The rest are new pins which mostly belong to all the peripherals inside this chip. So now we have timer in and timer out pins of two out of the three timers, which are quite similar to what the 8254 had. We have two DRQ pins for external DMA requests and instead of the int R, now we have a few interrupt request lines which are inputs of the built-in interrupt controller replacing our 8259. The rest of the new pins are chip select outputs from the address decoder. That's why you don't need the IOM pin anymore, because there are separate chip select pins available for addressing different parts of memory, as well as seven pins, each for a separate I.O. address range. All of these pins are programmatically configurable to some extent, and in general, all of the peripherals are programmable by accessing their registers in their predefined I.O. address space. I've built it on the breadboards off camera and this is the result. But before we test it, let me quickly go through the changes I had to make to the software. First of all, I've updated uh, the make file, uh, which now defines the CPU underscore type macro with the uh, value depending on the CPU we want to compile the whole projects for. So if it's uh, set to 186, it means that we want to build the, the project for the new processor and uh, all the changes follow uh, this uh, suit. So um, uh, as you can see, uh, systemdev.inc, the, all the settings for our project are now uh, split into two parts, some of them at least, uh, and they are looking for the CPU underscore type macro. So the old constants are here, and I've added uh, the new ones for 186 here. I used 8 megahertz crystal on this adapter together with the new CPU, and uh, the frequency is divided by two inside, so the CPU is clocked with 4 megahertz. 
So there's plenty more like this. Uh, one global change for both, uh, which I had to make, uh, is the the segment for uh, data in RAM. It doesn't matter for the old computer, it's just different because we uh, have half a meg uh, memory on both, but the chip select controller on the AT1888 uh, allows only to drive uh, from one pin maximum of quarter of a meg, so 250 kilobytes. Uh, so the RAM uh, in our new computer, even if it has 512 kilobytes of RAM, ends up at the address of uh, 3FFFF. Therefore, the, the data segment now starts from 3000 instead of 7000. It doesn't matter for the old computer, it's just different, but uh, it helps uh, with the new one. Then we've got, uh, again, addresses, I.O. addresses for our mm, devices. Now, in the new computer, you configure how the chip select for each I.O. device is driven for what addresses, uh, which the base one is uh, defined here. I defined it at, z at zero, so it's exactly the same as it was in the old computer. But the difference is that we have seven pins, seven separate pins for uh, selecting chips for I.O. devices and uh, each of them is separated by 128 bytes, not 16 bytes like in our own design. Uh, therefore, the first text LCD is at the same address, which is simply 0 and 1, but the next one, which is the buttons, uh, in our Old computer started at address of 10 hex, which is 16 bytes, but in this uh, computer I use the next available chip select pin, which is separated by 128 bytes, which is 80 hex. So these are small differences, uh, but then uh, we've got the whole list of all the registers which uh, set all the peripherals in the 186 or 188. Also, some uh, interrupt numbers, like in the original processor, for example, divide by zero is int zero. Here in our new processor, uh, some vectors are hard-coded as well. So we've got three timers at these vectors, then DMA and four inputs uh, raising external interrupts. So these are vector numbers for each of the uh, interrupt. And then after the else macro, we've got the old 8259, 8254, which we won't use in the new computer. And the system ticks is exactly the same. So I just introduced some minor changes plus all of the register names uh, existing in the 8188. Next file is a new file, it's uh, called, I called it system.asm and it's really just two functions which I moved from the PIT8254 because in the new computer we don't need this file at all, we don't have the 8254, uh, so I just moved the two functions from the bottom of this file into the new one which is common for both because we still want to use get systicks function as well as we need the interrupt handler which I just renamed to uh, this system timer in handler and it's installed in both version of the software we will see it in a second. Uh, main.c didn't change at all uh, I didn't change any of the code it's still the same common code for both the only change is to include system.h instead of uh, pit8254 because we're using this get sysstick function next file is the reset i need to add this three instructions here only for 188 so the chip select for the flash memory is activated by default after reset only for the top last kilobyte of memory. These three instructions configure this controller to activate the flash uh, for all the uh, 128 kilobytes of, uh, of memory. That's because once we do this jump 
at the beginning of the whole segment of memory, the flash wouldn't be activated and the processor wouldn't be able to read the next instruction. So that's what needs to be done before the jump, and then jump goes to into init function, which carries on with settings of a few things we have to set. Now we're in uh, init.asm, which as you can see, uh, we, I had to add a few more of these for chip select controller. Uh, similarly to the uh, flash memory, the upper memory, the lower memory um, activates only for, I think, one kilobyte again, uh, activates the, this pin. So I had to switch it to a maximum available, which is 256 kilobyte. That's what I mentioned uh, before. You can't configure it, unfortunately, for uh, address space larger than that. So we kind of lose half a RAM memory on this uh, breadboard, but it doesn't matter for now. Uh, and then there are some medium chip selects which uh, could be activated somewhere between the RAM and the ROM. I don't use them at all, so I just um, configure them for some minimum uh, uh, size at some unused address uh, in our code. Um, and then the uh, peripheral uh, chip select, so the I.O., which we... Uh, that's an error, it should be zero. Yes, which we set to uh, the base address to zero, and then each of the pins from PCS0 to PCS7 are separated and being activated for contiguous 128 addresses in the I.O. space. The rest of the code is exactly the same. Uh, I call pick init and PIT init functions because that's uh, how originally they were named. Obviously, we do not compile the 8254 or the 8259 code at all in this version. Uh, but I created a new file, a common new file for the all peripherals in our new CPU perif. 186, which contains those functions. Uh, so similarly, we're just writing some data into our I.O. space where the CPU registers exist. Uh, so we are setting the uh, interrupt controller by these two writes and a few more, including calculating uh, the proper counter limit to achieve our system ticks per second. Uh, and that's it, pretty much, of the whole new code. All the rest of the code, uh, so the main function and all debug uh, interrupt are exactly the same. I made no changes at all into these files. Uh, and that's it. So uh, you can now compile uh, for both a uh, processor and both breadboards the same code and as you will see in a second it should work exactly the same okay let's see if i was right and there you go it looks like it's uh, working uh, like it did on the old computer we're using now new timer there is no 8254 there is no 8259 uh, it's all in this little chip uh, 80, uh, 8188. I can obviously uh, use the debug mode as well, but since you've probably noticed, uh, the display here, the LCD, is just 16 characters in two lines instead of 20 uh, and four lines. And the only reason for that was that the, the blue, the original, bigger LCD, just didn't fit here uh, above the zip socket here um, so i had to switch to a smaller one so we can't see all the informations which we had on the blue the bigger lcd uh, but we still can step through the code and observe its behavior the code is exactly the same apart from those little changes i showed you just a minute ago which were to do with the new hardware we have inside this 8188. Okay, now as a bonus, let's run both computers at the same time. The only thing I need to do is to just um, 
get the power supply together from one to another and then supply them both from the left hand side. Let's see. That's it for this video. Thank you for watching and please don't forget to click on the like button and subscribe. This is extremely important for the future existence of this channel. Thank you and see you again.